Well, all right. Well, it's good to be here this morning. Those of you on Facebook, I'm going to sit here and wait until we hit about 10,000 views and then we'll get after it. We're <laughs> going to be that's, here until midnight. We'll, we'll be here a while, won't we? That's okay. It gets out there. So uh, we do appreciate you being here. Uh, this is uh, lesson 14 on our series. And today I, I like to change the title up a little bit. Today I'm just saying redefining the reason for Jesus' passion. Because that's why we're really doing this. Is we're uh, Like Brother Garner used to say back in 1996, we're taking a second look at the cross. Well, we've had some third and fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and seventh is completion and perfection so i hope we're really getting it you know and i don't want to say he didn't get it right we all got it right back then from our perception but i believe as we have studied and fed and people around the world has done this too that our perception is getting greater and greater and greater and now we're seeing clearly we're not seeing through a glass darkly and it's it's hard to believe that back in 1996 i was still seeing through a glass darkly but my vision was getting better. The Holy Spirit was using a little more Windex on the glass and <laughs> helping us see more and more and more. Amen? Amen. And so I'm excited about this. I always say that. We, me and Donna had a conversation come to the church today, talk about how I still like to be immature. I'm very mature in the Word of God, but in my life I'm, in, I'm immature. I'm still a child. I like to approach life as a child. Jesus said we must come as a child. Uh, I never want to get to the place where... Looking at a beautiful tree doesn't awe me, or looking at a beautiful pond, or a scenery, or whatever. And I never want to get to the place when I look in the Word, it doesn't awe me. Mm-hmm. And there's so many aha moments, it's unbelievable. The Bible in the book of Revelation calls them twinkling of an eye experiences. And I believe we will live eternity doing that, because as Brother Garner said all the time, it's the uh, inexhaustible Word of God. Mm-hmm. And, and he knew that, and we all know that too. So it, this is... There's a desperate need, family, for us to really embrace these things that we're teaching and learn them and believe them and see them and be able to articulate them ourselves because there's a world out there that really needs your help and they're hungry for the truth. Uh, I was, uh, I'm, I've never considered myself to be a counselor, but now that I know what the word counsel means, you know, another comforter, it's a counselor, it's a leader and teacher. Uh, I had a gentleman ask me to uh, talk to him some and help him. And I've had this happen before, but one of the things that this person said to me was he had been in a very religious denomination, and he was all bound up with it, and he always lived in fear. And so he ended up going to a great big denomination somewhere to seek counsel, and he talked to the pastor, and the pastor, uh, after he asked him if he had been saved, and he said yes, and what church was you saved in? He told him, he said, well, you didn't say the right words. And that's the reason you're struggling, is because you didn't say the right words. And so he instructed in the right words to get saved and what needs to be said over him when he was baptized in the water by then. And then he declared that he was saved. And I asked him if it helped him, and he said, not one bit. And I also asked him, I said, uh, all the religious teaching that you had all your life, have you ever heard anything that makes you free from fear? And he said, none. And I said, that's the reason why. It's because we didn't teach the truthful gospel. We taught the gospel in the way that we knew it and also infected by our religious upbringing. If I decide to go to Bible college at 30, 40, 50 years old, every place I've been prior to that is going to affect what I hear. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I was raised one denomination or whatever, that's the filter that I'm going to bring things through. And literally, when you see a truth, that filter robs it and hides it, and your perception is, oh, that means this. That's only people who are saved. Right? Right? I watched a video last night, and I thought I was going to be interested, and next thing you know, a gentleman uh, was talking about some people that are involved in things that the church would call sin, you know, one of the biggies, if you would, and he said, well, the way I approach them is when they come to me and they tell me that they are something, you know, let's just say I'm an alcoholic, he'll say, well, I'm an alcoholic, I'm an alcoholic too. I was an alcoholic when I was born, and I, I got that wrong. If they say I was born an alcoholic, then he would say, I was born an alcoholic too. And I thought, well, he's getting ready to say something really nice. But then he turned around and said, when I was born, I was born in sin and I was a degenerate and had an animalistic nature. And I thought, how would that help anybody? (laughs) If you told me that, I'd just turn and walk away because you just told me I'm an animal. You know, so people have a really bad perception of God and the truth. And so we want to continue to feed on the truth. Last week, I left off in Colossians 1.21 talking about how Paul said you were sometime... And he's talking about the condition of man before the cross. You were sometime 
are formerly alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. And we know wicked means restless. So by restless works, and what are restless works? What would you think restless works would be? The Bible calls them, what, what do you think a restless work is? It's, it's rules of, of trying to be right with God. It's religion works. It's, it's called filthy works too. And those are, those are trying to obey the law. The law is restless works because you haven't entered into rest, so you're always trying to please God. And like this brother told me, and I told him, I said, the only, only, wrong, only thing wrong with you is you've not entered into the rest of God, and you need to hear how God loves you already. And then you won't enter into those restless works. I know this last Sunday I played with this ink pen, so I'll put it up. <laughs> I had it in my hand the whole time. So, uh, and so it says, and yet now hath he reconciled. So I made this point, and I want to say it again. God did not need us to be reconciled to him. We needed, in our, in our understanding, to be reconciled. We needed everything removed away from us that hindered us from being one with God in our understanding. But God held nothing against us. And I always explain reconciliation sometimes about me and Donna having something wrong with each other. And if somebody comes on and reconciles, is they're, they're helping solve the problem we have. But that's not the reconciliation Paul's talking about. Man needed to be reconciled to God because they thought that they had done something wrong. And I say again, I will no longer say I've never sinned because sin is unbelief, sin is self-condemnation. And I have experienced self-condemnation many times in my life. And the fruit of that. But I, I can boldly say now, I have never done anything in my entire life to separate me from God. Yeah. Never. From His love whatsoever. So we talked about the words alienated. And again, uh, uh, sometimes people ask me why I use so many synonyms when I explain something or when I translate scripture. Well, I just think some people might understand it from one word and some from another word. Yes. We need different pictures, don't we? <laughs> you know, that's why we do picture after picture after picture in the Old Testament because some people won't understand this one, but the other one they'll get. Just like Barbara Ward years ago, she couldn't understand what we were saying. You know, we, she came to our church, some came to our fellowship, but when Judy wrote that song where it said, he post my ear, to the, I nail my ear to the post of the door and all that, that's, that was her picture. And she sat right on that front row at that fellowship on South Young, and she had an earthquake. Not just lightnings and thunderings, but she had an earthquake. So it's important for us to say things in every different way to make sure people can understand that we are not separated from God, but yet people thought that they were. And because of that, they condemned themselves. Now let's go to Romans 5.16. Romans 5.16. So again, what is it that makes people feel alienated? Religion. The word religion means to bind up and hold back, and that's what makes you feel alienated because there is not a, quote, church that I know of in the world that is part of a religious system that you can go to that they're not going to, once you come in there and they love you and they ask you in, that they're not going to start telling you what you need to do. Yeah. Correct? I don't know any of them, and I've thought about them. I don't know any of them that's not going to tell you what you need to do to please God. Yeah. It's because they don't feel pleased themselves. So the truth of the matter is man never was separate from our creator. Only in his mind or his conscious awareness was he alienated. Romans 5.16. So, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to, you can write there, self-condemnation. Not condemnation from God, but self-condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. And then drop down to verse 18. And Paul says, and he's explaining all this. He says, even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So Jesus was the right one. He was the only one that, that and what we mean by right, and what we mean by righteous, he was the only one that was aware that he was righteous. Because we have concluded, as Paul said, reckon these things to be so, we have concluded that every person ever born was righteous. Right, right means, righteous means right wise with God. And how do we know that, Donna? We know that because when Adam uh, entered into uh, a law-minded, a, he fed from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he saw something maybe in himself or their self that they thought, thought separated them from God because they knew that they did what he said they shouldn't do. Then they saw themselves as naked. They saw themselves as the void of God. But again, God said, who told you that? So you're, I didn't, who told you that you're not righteous? Who told you that you've done something that can separate you from, from me? And so 
uh, the gift upon all men unto justification. Justification means to me that he awakens me to life. He awakens me to righteousness. And that's really what quicken was and what Jesus did on the, on the life side of the cross. Cruc- uh, quicken, raised, and seated is he, he brought us back to that place where we can live out of the Spirit and realize that we are righteous right now. And he didn't make us righteous. And see, a few people wrote me about that the other day, that Jesus, because I always thought in the resurrection we were made righteous. No, we were not made righteous. We were righteous already. We were awakened to that. Quicken means revivified and pushed forward, you know, and bring to realization. So the new King, King James renders this by the righteousness of one man's act resulting in justification of life. In other words, what he did enabled us to start living what he said he came to bring. Did he ever say he came to bring righteousness? Did he ever say that he came to cause man to be one with God again? Never. You know, people say, oh, well, wait a minute. He said he came to save the lost. No, he didn't say that. He said he came to save that which was lost. And that which was lost was man's understanding of God. Man's living out of that experience with God. Life and life more abundantly was lost. It was still there, but people weren't living out of that. Because life and life more abundantly doesn't include anything that Adam uh, brought man down to. The Bible calls it the pit. I mean, it is the pit when you have arthritis. It's the pit when your knees don't feel good. I say it all the time. People will talk to me about my knees and I say, it's just the pits. Yeah. <laughs> but it is. That's the pit living life. And who wants to live in the pit life? Not me. I want to be up on that mountaintop. Yes. And so Jesus brought us to that place where we can live out of a mountaintop experience. And a mountaintop experience is always learning something about God. I've told you this before, but every time in the Old Testament when God called people up to a mountain, it was so he could show them something. It wasn't to punish them, you know. I talked to a man last night in Chickasha. Anna Carl knows him. I'm so excited. But I asked him, I said, with, with your understanding of God right now, because he's still hounded, but he's waking up a lot, and I'm excited for him. If you're on here, I'm so excited to get to fellowship with you, or if you're watching. But I asked him, I said, if God was in a room over, you know, behind you, and I said, would you, if God wanted to see you, you know, I've asked you that before. If God, I said, God wants to see you, would you go right in there? And he said, no. <laughs> he said, I'd have to go get myself right first. I'd have to go pray. I'd have to make sure that, you know, and that's what people would do. Mm-hmm. Really would. Because that, that, that are religious minded because of that fear that's been placed in us. Mm-hmm. So Paul is writing of how Jesus redefined, restored everything that had to do with the descent of man. People, some people say fall, and that's okay. But he didn't fall from grace. <laughs> he didn't fall from who he was, but he descended. He left that realm. It's just like the uh, prodigal. The prodigal descended or left the realm that he was living in, didn't he? I talked about him last week. For some reason, he, he didn't realize who he was. He didn't realize that all that his father had was his and the other brother too. He didn't realize that the life that he thought he could get somewhere else, he had already. So he descended, if he would, and left that realm, spent it all, wasted it all, and was starving to death. And so that, that's what took place. And so uh, it, it affected the subsequent effect of, uh, of the life of all humanity of him. Look at Romans 19 now. It says in the King James Version, by the obedience of one, and it says, shall all be made righteous. You can write where it says made, I would write awakened to. You mean 519. 519. What did I say? 19. I'm sorry, 519. By the obedience of one, shall all be made righteous. So where it says made, I would put awakened to. And where it says shall, it's always exist. Because it makes it like he's saying it's going to happen in the future, Right? So Jesus' work calls everybody to exist righteous right then. Whether you ever feel righteous or not, whether you, whether you ever line up with what the church world calls righteous, you are righteous now because Jesus, God made you that way in the beginning and Jesus removed that which was hindrance so we can know that we're righteous. Down deep inside, you know, if you really listen to your spirit, you will know that you are. Yes. And that's why Judy wrote that song, Who Are You Listening To? You're not naked. You, you wear a righteous suit. In other words, that's who you are. So what you've got to ask yourself is, who have you been listening to? And then quit listening to it. And this is my translation of it. Therefore, it's by the self-condemnation of one and all humanity, and that's Adam, an opposing self-condemnation came. In this way, in right standing, standing means uh, uh, understanding, if you would. 
if I'm standing in something, it's because I know who I am, right? I've explained that to you in my business. No matter where I go in my business, I'm very confident to stand. And if the president of the company is out there, the vice president, if all the leaders are in the audience, I can stand on the fact that I know what I'm talking about. And I'm not ashamed. I'm not embarrassed. I'm not scared. I don't sweat. I don't. I stand there and boldly declare the truth that I how I teach people to sell prearranged funerals. So in the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm standing yes. in what God has taught me. So that's what He's saying here. In right standing, that was Jesus. In one new, energized, vitalized man rendered all mankind just and innocent to live out of a Zoe life, to live out of life. And that went all the way back to the first man, Adam, right? And everybody that had left their body, they awakened to the heavenly already. They learned it before anybody else did. You know, we used to think, some people think they're in a holding place. Some people think they're in the grave asleep. A lot of people believe that. I hear that in the funeral industry all the time, that when I die, it's going to be all right because I'm just going to be asleep until Jesus comes back. Well, some people have been asleep for 6,000 years or more. <laughs> That's a long time, man. <laughs> so I don't like that doctrine. So the Apostle Paul's presentation in the book of Romans and his other epistles redefines everything that happened to man, redefines what Jesus did as the federal head, and as the result of partaking of the knowledge of good and evil, that's what happened to them. And he's explaining every bit of that. So uh, we, we want, I want to show you another translation. Look at John, I mean, a uh, transitional scripture. Look at John 12 and 31 and 32. John 12, 31 and 32. Now remember the word judgment means decree, a decision, or a proclamation. It doesn't mean God's going to punish you. It doesn't mean if you don't have your name in the book of life, you go to that door. And I was thinking about that last night. You know the book of Revelation talks about the book written within and without, right? So that's us, correct? That's man. And then we've always heard the story that, uh, that they're going to look in the book of life for your name, you know? Well, it's, it's your nature. It's your nature. People need to look in your book of life and see the nature of God within you. And he writes that in you. You can't get that. It's already there. You can't get uh, peace and joy. It's there already. You just need to know where to, to get it from, right? It's just like the scientists are finding out there's places in our body that they can get things to help other people. Like if you have a certain kind of cancer, which is what, leukemia? that they can do a bone marrow transplant so they know where to look and get my bone marrow and put it in you. Well, you, you, the reason we don't have peace and joy, the reason we're weak and sick and die needless is because we don't know where to get the life from that deals with that, and which we do. It's our spirit. It's by faith we lean to our spirit. So it says now is the decree, the decision, the declaration of this world. Now the prince of this world is going to be cast out. See, what that meant, not talking about an individual person, but it's the condition of man. Was the, because all people are the prince of the world. There's places in the Old Testament where God spoke to him and said, you shall die as princes. You're the prince of this world, but you're going to die as a prince. How many of you know that there are people that have died living a very, very poor life, and they were millionaires? So they died as millionaires. In other words, they never experienced what they could have experienced. And so many people today, and for a long, long time, a couple thousand years, have died as princes not knowing it. Died with a life source inside of them. Died with Jehovah Jireh, or excuse me, Jehovah their health. Jehovah Rapha their health. Died having everything that they ever need in their body to bring physical life or spiritual life. But yet they died because they didn't know who they were. And, and if one of us dies... We, we, we're, we're dying because we haven't fully awakened yet. And that's the only reason. People need to quit saying, why are people dying? They die because we don't know who they are. We, and, and it's the collectiveness. It's, you know, a little child. You, you mean they have to go to college and learn? No, it's the collectiveness of mankind that's done that. And we give birth to children. And as a child, we don't teach them who they are as they grow up. Right? So... And it said, if I be lifted up from the earth, we'll draw all unto me. It says all men, and that's all right. But what he was talking about, and I, I don't actually meet, believe that's actually at the cross. I believe it's in the Garden of Gethsemane. I believe what he means by lifted up is I believe he was removed from this earthen vessel that he was. And then he became 
a earthen vessel that was filled with a degenerate nature activity. I, I, in my understanding of that, if I can paraphrase that, but he was, he, he, he was lifted up, if you would, and he, he was emptied out of himself, and he drew into himself every bit of the degener degenerate nature activity, and he made a void, and that's destroying the prince of this world. That's what was in the prince of this world. So again, if there is a race of people out there that has a disease that's spreading through the world, and if we could get to that people before that, and destroy that, or kill them if you would, then it would stop that. So Jesus didn't kill people, but Jesus killed what was causing that. And it was a, so what did we say Jesus came for? Can anybody tell me the three things that Jesus came for that I talked about last week? Donna, was you here last week? Donna Misi, so you're excused. Did you watch the video? Then you're not excused. <laughs> anybody tell me, what, why did Jesus come? Three different things. I'm a horrible teacher. <laughs> or you're not listening with intelligence. One, one was to show us God. Right? In this earth walk, he revealed God. He revealed the love of God. Two was to do away with the sacrificial system. Remember that? I know you know it. To do away the sacrificial system. And three was to destroy that which hindered man. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifest to destroy him that had the power of death. And that was... Adam, that was the first man, Adam. And then he destroyed the works that the first man, Adam, released. And that's talking about all people before the cross. So next week you'll be able to say that, right? It's not as hard as crucified, died very quick and raised and seated, is it? <laughs> so he came to reveal the Father in his earth walk. He came to end the sacrificial system because God never wanted sacrifice. And then he came to destroy what hindered and introduced man was that degenerate nature activity and that sense of self-condemnation. And it sent, we could fill in a lot of stuff there. So, it's good, huh? It's really good. Isn't that awesome? I think I'll patent that. <laughs> in a nutshell. So, my translation or my explanation or my version, I saw writing the other night people were talking about people that shouldn't translate scripture. So, I'll just say it's my version. I'm, it may be a bit easier for them. But it says, now I exist at the decision concerning the state of the cosmos system of this age. Now to make void and bring to naught the degenerate nature activity and self-condemnation Adam released in man. And how it affected the orderly arrangements of the cosmos, thrusting it out. Even so, in my messianic redemptive work, will I draw all the whole of what Adam released into myself. All of it. He didn't leave nothing out. We have no residue of the estate of the first man, Adam. People used to say, well, you just, it's the residue that's making me do it. Well, if you're, if you're brand new, you have no residue. Yeah. You know, if you take my, my uh, Honda Pilot out there and you take it and you just destroy it, just destroy it and melt it away and bring me a brand new car, I have no residue of that. If you took it and took some parts off from it, you know, or maybe melted the metal and formed another vehicle or whatever, then it's the residue of my Honda Pilot. It still has the same steel in it or whatever. But no, we're, we're brand new. We're made out of pure gold. We're in there. We're in there. And it was secured by silver. <laughs> Redemption. And we have a brand new, we, we, we have been awakened. And, it's, and again, we were that way before the cross. Man was that way, but they didn't know it. But now we are made that. In other words, we are awakened to the fact that we're brand new. And we, nothing that hindered the first man, Adam, is in us whatsoever. What's in us now is a lot of wrong understanding and a lot of wrong teaching. That's all it is. It's not my lying, cheating, cussing, eating ice cream, whatever that is. You know, it's just we, we've got to defrag our brains, our, our, yeah, our brains, our conscious awareness, and that's what we're doing. And from glory to glory, from appearing to appearing, he's changing you. I mean, how many revelations have we received that's literally changed our life? You know, I always tell people about my wife. The greatest revelation that she received that I think helped her because she wasn't sure if her 18-year-old sister was with God because we grew up around her grandparents and we were taught about hell and all that stuff. And she died in a horrible car wreck. And she doesn't know if she ever walked and said a sinner's prayer or whatever like the church taught. So that's been an unsure thing with her most of her life. But when she discovered the love of God... But it took, even that, it took us until we met Brother Garner and we began to realize that there's no such place as hell. And we, re, we realized all that, it freed you, didn't it, Donna? Mm -hmm. It was a life-changing experience for her. It freed her from torment. I mean, I can't imagine 
what it is for people that have loved ones that have died and they're not sure about their life. You know, I was told by an uncle that he was hoping because my dad did some things he shouldn't have done that when we did the funeral for my daddy he, he, at, the, at the cemetery, no, for my cousin, but what I preached made him mad and he said, he said, your daddy is burning in hell right now. Said that to me. And if I didn't know who I was, how would that hurt? That would be horrible. You know, so I'm thankful for these revelations that come to us. So now, where it says now, when is now? It was back then. That's all right. It's, but if, if I say something now, Donna, Donna, right now, go to the back row. That's now. But see, Jesus said now. Now I exist. I exist to do this. I exist to do this. This is my decision. It's God and me, though. See, God, God, uh, God chose for Jesus to do it. God didn't come as some monster or some great big God that would scare us half to death and say, I'm going to get all of you. I'm going to burn you all up and start all over again. No, he, he showed us his nature because we can't understand his nature as just a spirit. Can you? I still can't fathom God as spirit. Because all my life I wanted to see God someday. I wanted to, I wanted to talk to God as a, you know, as a, as a body. You know, but I do talk to God. I listen to God. But I still, my brain just can't wrap around what it means to be spirit. Although I have some understanding. So, like that story I told you about the ant. You know, the ants are heading towards an ant eater. Did y'all hear that? No. Oh, I wrote it on Facebook. And I was, I was just, I was uh, talking about how God became man. God became a man. That, 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 that I love ants and I'm looking at ants and there's a whole herd of ants. I don't know what they call them, but thousands of them. And they've got their babies with them and their eggs and they're trying to get to a better place. And they're, they're heading down that aisle and about 10 feet down there is an aardvark or whatever eats ants. An ant eater is down there. And I say, hey, you got to turn your direction. Well, I'm too big for them. I don't speak their language, Right. They don't understand what I'm saying, so they just keep heading that way. So the only way I could do it is I love them so much that I'm going to become an ant. So I become an ant, and I go down there and I speak their language, and I save their lives. And that's what God did. And Jesus came and spoke our language. See, God's language is a most holy place language. God tried to do it through prophets. And he spoke by way of prophets, and they couldn't understand that language that they were speaking. Even the Apostle Paul said, I knew a man, whether he was in a body or out of body, and he saw some things that were unlawful to say. It was a foreign language. And he, they couldn't understand him. So God spent, sent somebody that would speak their language and try to give them most holy place understandings, but they couldn't speak a most holy place understanding. They couldn't hear it, so they still wanted Jesus just to stay there and be their king and be their miracle man. So he said, you know what, guys, you can't speak, you can't understand my language still. And I understand. You're not living out of your spirit. So I have to go away, but I'm going to send another comforter, which means many more comforters. I'm going to send comforters that can speak your language, but also can bring you up to a higher, higher awareness until you can understand the most holy place language. Isn't that a great picture? God just showed me that in the flash of an eye. And, and that's really what took place. And today we don't need, and that's why I'm saying God, Spirit is so big that if you're currently mind dead, you can't understand the voice of God. But you have to learn, you have to get to the end of that, if you would. Yes. And when you get to the end of that, then you can start hearing things, and they're those unlawful things that Paul couldn't speak at this time. There are people that I can go to their home today, and it's unlawful for me to speak with this language. And I can sense that. But then I sense when I'll say a little one or two things and, I, and they, they grab hold of that and I begin to sense, oh, they can hear more. And so I share, but then all of a sudden it gets to the point where I recognize that's it and so I stop right there. Yeah. But there will be a day, and, it's a, and today is the day, that there are millions and millions of people that can hear a most holy place language and I'm excited about that. So we need to learn to read scripture in the light of the nows of the Bible. And understand when it said now, it was talking about people from the foundation of the world. Uh, because the Bible defines the scripture, and it, it, it would show us the scripture in an entirely different light when we understand that. Because people think when it says a point once for man to die, then the judgment, they think that's in our future. Right? 
But that appointment was all the way back at Adam. Adam made that appointment. Adam made that choice. You know, if, if Rod uh, marries Sandy and he chooses to never work, they have two or three children. He chooses to never work and support her, and Sandy's got four or five kids, so she can't go to work. Then Rod appointed a certain kind of life for them. And in this world, it would be depending on a system. They'd have to get food stamps. They would have to get uh, help with everything, right? And so, huh? <laughs> so, so you, so literally, you appointed that life for them. My choices I made appointed Donna's life and my kids' life yes. the whole time they were with me. You know? Does that make sense? Yes, and so that's what Adam did. But guess what? Jesus came and appointed a new life for us. He destroyed that old life and he appointed a new life. Uh, there's a man that's going to marry my daughter. I believe he is. I pray he is. He's 10 years older than her. And for a while we got a little scared because he was just buying her gifts after gifts after gifts. He was changing her life, literally. But he did it because that's his nature. He loves to give people. I believe that. But they're getting ready to get married. And guess what? He's going to appoint a brand new life for her and her kids. Brand new. He's going to take it out of her struggling to barely make ends meet. You know, living in that 850 square foot home that I provided for because I don't want to make it too easy. You know, <laughs> stay there forever. But they're going to go out and get a 2,000 square foot home. They're going to have, they're going to have a good income. I'm not saying everything's going to be perfect, but he's going to appoint her a brand new life. Yeah. Hallelujah. Do you realize today you can rewrite your life? Yes. Can't do nothing about the past, but you can rewrite your life today if you'll just believe. If you'll just believe that God loves you unconditionally and you believe that there's much more in this Bible than what you've been told and study it with your most holy place eyes and your most holy place ears. And I can hear people saying out there, Pastor Roy, how do you do it? You do it by faith. Yes. Every time you open your Bible, you say, Father, I believe there are things that are hidden in me, in this, in this word, and your scripture says it was your pleasure to hide those things so we can mine them out. But we don't have to mine them out by ourselves. We is me and you. Yes. Me and you, me and the Father, me and my Holy Spirit. And you can rewrite your life today. And all that stuff that's been said about you, or you said to yourself, will just begin to melt away. I believe that with all my heart. If you want a prophecy, that's a prophecy to you. That's a word of knowledge to you. Amen? So, <clears throat> let me get where I'm at. So we're not, in a, we're not living in a fallen world. We do not live in a fallen world. Carl looks like it though, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, we watched a commercial on TV last night on HGTV, and it blew my mind how bold it was. It was about the Florida Keys, and it was all talking about how we're different than everybody else. And, you know, homosexuals, lesbians showed people, mar same genders marrying each other, a full commercial about that. You know, and here again, I'm not attacking homosexuals and lesbians. They're not, you know, we, we, I, we love them. You know, we don't love what's done. Just like I love people that's gotten married, uh, three or four div uh, divorces. I don't like that they did that, but I still love them. I don't judge anybody. They're all righteous and holy. But pe they're, they're beginning to boldly thrust their agendas. Yeah. Every system is. But it still doesn't mean the world's fallen. No. We've got to go by what we know and not by what we see because if we walk by sight, we're going to fail. Amen? Yes. We're going to agree with it. Mm -hmm. So that's why we say we must see the end from the beginning. The end is this whole earth not just full of God's glory because it already is, but this whole earth experiencing and rendering apparent the Christ within them. I don't tell people they're doing anything wrong anymore. I don't say you got to quit being a homosexual, you got to quit being a lesbian. Well, I was told a homosexual is both of those, so I guess I should quit saying that. I don't say you need to quit being an alcoholic or anything. I just say you need to come feed and let the Christ in you conform you to the image of God. And see, that's what saddens me. People say, well, I was born this way, or this is the way I'm supposed to be, or God created me this way. No, the way we are today, religion is created as that way. Yeah. Circumstances of life are created. And what saddens me is people don't want to be conformed to what God wants for them. They just want to say, I'm okay, you're okay. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's true, then since Jesus resurrected, this earth should be different. Since Christ the new man came out of that grave, the elements should be coming under the control of the people. We are the body of Christ. We are the prince of this world. If that's true, we should be able to bring things right in right order, and we haven't. So our, our theology is wrong, and our belief system is wrong. All it does is make me feel better about what I'm doing. 
I mean, God made cows, didn't he? And he made milk and cream. So, of course, there would be ice cream for me to eat. God did it, not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't come out ice cream. It comes out milk. <laughs> <laughs> How thick is that milk? <laughs> so, the teaching that we live in a fallen world is Babylon. It's confusion. Kay Fairchild calls it baloney. Yeah. <laughs> So this religion teaches uh, teacher the, the religion teachers have never understood the now the now with God. When was the now? It was back in, when Adam back then. Adam's the one that released the judgment, and the decision was made by Jesus, destroyed over two thousand years ago. We are not waiting for a future coming of Jesus to do anything. So the condition of that ruler or the prince, if you would, uh, was cast out, was melted away, was made void, brought to naught. You know, I, I think it's important to use all that. That's what the word cardigale means. Made void, brought to naught. Literally, it says not. It is not. It's not the truth. It, it's not there anymore. So we live in a brand new world. We live as many-membered people. We are the true light of the world. John said that. As long as Jesus was in the earth, he was the true light. Right? He was the light of the world. But it says that he lit the light of every man. He lit our light, if you would. So we're the true light of the world. And we're supposed to go forth and sh let that light shine. And yet it looks like a fallen world. But don't receive that information. Don't receive it. You know, when I see things, when people are doing things that don't reflect their who they are, uh, I just want, I, I get disgusted, don't you? But I've got to make myself see who they are. I'm not disgusted with them. That's where I need to get to. Because I can't tell you I've never not been disgusted with somebody. You tell me about somebody, like one of our re representatives just recently was arrested. He was found in a motel with a 17-year-old boy. His son advertises himself on Craigslist for sale. And I'm, I'm just saying when I first heard it, well, Don, it's all over the news. I know. But it makes you disgusted with him, right? And see, we've got to get to that place where I'm not disgusted with him. I don't like what he's done, but I'm, what I'm disgusted with is what made him to be that way. I'm disgusted with the fact that people have not entered into the rest of God. If we could get people to enter into the rest of God and get their peace and joy from their Holy Spirit, all that stuff would stop. And that's why I tell people, I am not going to counsel you and tell you how to quit anything. I'm going to counsel you and tell you who you are and remove the lie. I'm going to tell you, and I, I love, I love what I that joke, that thing we saw that video once where that star was counseling, and it was like ten dollars, fifteen dollars for fifteen minutes of counseling. And after she said everything that was wrong, then he said, "Stop it." Well, that's what Paul said, wasn't it? Yeah. Stop assuming that outward expression. Stop this. Stop. He said it many times. So because of who you are now, what I explained to you, you can stop it now. He never said stop it until he explained why you can stop it. All my life, all I heard is stop it, stop it, stop it. But nobody told me who I was. Yeah. Nobody told me that that wasn't apparent in my life. I mean, how can I stop it when there's a devil there always tempting me? Well, then when I learned the truth, what it was is I yielded myself to that stuff because I didn't know that peace came from within. I didn't know that all pleasure that I ever needed came from my intimate relationship with my Father God. So once I explain these to you, then you can stop it. And what do I mean by stop it? I don't mean stop what you're so much eating the ice cream or whatever. I mean stop condemning yourself. That's the first thing you've got to do. You've got to stop condemning yourself for eating the ice cream. And then you've got to lean to the Spirit and draw from the Christ life within you that makes that fade away. Because the lover of your soul is much greater than those false loves that come from out there. Amen. The lover of my soul can give me a greater high than heroin Amen. or cocaine. Yeah. Right? Amen. I believe that with all my heart. So uh, the only problem is because of much wrong teaching, the inhabitants are still asleep to the truth of who we be. That's, that's the, really the only problem. From the Garden of Gethsemane to the cross of Calvary is, uh, Calvary is where all the redefinition took place. Where Jesus did the end of that. So John 12, 32 is where Jesus' choice and decision was the end of all the false concepts. See, it was a false concept that God was going to judge us. 
and it took place at the cross. The only definition of God's judgment was Jesus Christ and the end of all judgment. So that says a lot of people thinking that judgment's coming today. And I hear it all the time. Yeah. We'll give an account of what we've done. Right. So we need to help people with that. Again, people think they're going to go to heaven and they're going to stand before God and, and uh, talk about everything that you've ever done. Boy, he's going to be a busy God, isn't he? <laughs> really. And, they, and then there's some people that think they're going to stand before an angel and he's going to look in the book of life. And if your name's not there, boom, you're gone. And people joke about it all the time. Where my name is, there's a great big eraser spot. Because I get put back in, then I take out. I mean, God's, you know, God's a schizophrenic or something. I don't, he's bipolar. I mean, one moment he loves me, one moment, well, hey, I don't like Roy no more. He didn't give money today, so erase his name. Oh, he did something good. Put his name back in. How silly is that? Very strong piece of paper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I got a guy the other day, I was trying to share him about hell, and I just kept talking to him and talking to him, and I finally thought, well, he needs a really big picture to help him. So I said, let's figure out how many people live on planet Earth right now. Do you know how many? And, you know, he couldn't tell me. And I said, well, it's well over a billion. So let's just say a billion, all right? So let's go back in time. So a billion this year. You know, a generation ago, 40 generations, another billion, 40 generation, another billion. Then maybe it goes to trillions, maybe it goes to millions, all the way back to the beginning of time. Or let's just go back to Adam, 6,000 years. That's the number so big that you can't count. And they say that only about 20% of people in the world are Christians. And most Christians think you've got to be a Christian and go to heaven, right? So that leaves 80% of all those people burning in eternal hell. That's what I said to him. I said, and he looked at me kind of funny, and I said, that means God is a horrible, horrible failure. And he thought for a minute, and he said, all right, I believe you. <laughs> you know, sometimes it takes a picture like that. But it's the truth. Oh, but God, God didn't want him to go. You hear that all the time. It's their own choice. But, but if that's true, then God made that place. Yeah. What kind of father is that? That I love you, but if you, I, I'm going to make a place that's eternal torment just in case you don't believe me. Or even after that, if you mess up and you don't ask me to forgive you. Sick. We believe think some pretty it. silly think stuff. Huh? Think about it. I know. Think about it. And I know people out there, not people listening to me, but religious people won't like that. But if they will stop and think... Brother Garner said, bring your brain to church. Bring your brain to church. Learn how to listen to your mind, your mind to Christ. So Jesus drew all into him, all judgment in himself. So they are one and the same. All men partook of the judgment that was given to God. I mean, it was given by Adam. All men. So you can say he drew all men in himself. I say he drew all the degenerate nature activity. That was the state of man. Hebrew 9.26, this is, a, again, a, a one that's quoted a lot by ministers that really don't have any understanding. <laughs> yeah, I'm bold. <laughs> well, they, I did it once. I, I quoted it, and I said, you know, we're all appointed once for man to die, then the judgment, so you better get saved, but then you're going to have to answer for everything you did after that too, right? I believe that we were going to stand before the great white, white throne of judgment a long time ago. You know, so uh, it says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. Jesus is talking about our great high priest, or, or Paul, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. When was the end of the world? The world that he's talking about then was that, that system. It was the end when Jesus resurrected. Actually, it was the end when Jesus died because Jesus became human and he died. He became the, the, the federal head, last man Adam. And that was the end when it died. When would be the end of cancer? At the cross. Huh? At the cross. When he died on the cross, that was the end. Amen. When, when, if, if, if the end of cancer could come, we would, everybody that's ever died from it died, and we only had one person left that had cancer in it. Or let's just say the flu. That's the one that people just spreads all over the place. How could the flu stop? And my mindset, I don't think the flu hangs out on a tree somewhere. You know, virus. Sometimes I wonder if they don't spray it. Because <laughs> they always know when it's coming. <laughs> yeah. And they can even tell you what type it is. 
but it's because people have had it on other parts of the world. But if we, if all those people that had the flu of 10,000 miles away from us, that it was going to spread this way, if they all died, every one of them died, would that not be the end of the flu? Every one of them died. We hope so. Well, but they, if they all died. But if one escaped, it would spread again. Well, see, there again goes that residue part. Well, no, he didn't kill all of it. Some of it was still left. Some people didn't believe and didn't get saved. <laughs> you know, I know I've been silly today, but it's important for us to get this. For them must he oft, often have sacrificed since the foundation of the world. But now, now, when? At the cross, back then, once into the end of the world, that system hath he appeared, he rendered very apparent to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. By the sacrifice of himself. So the new King James renders, renders this once at the end of the ages. The end is singular. The ages is plural. The end is singular. The ages is plural. And that's talking about where two ages came together to create one. He brought the two together. He destroyed what was hindering it. And he created one new world. The fallen age became the restored age. Became the restored age. Verse 27 is where people go crazy. And it's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And you hear me say it all the time. Right here in this funeral home, it's said all the time. All the time. We don't know why God took your loved one. We don't know why he took your child. We don't know why he took your husband. We can't answer those questions. But the Bible says it's one and once for man to die, then the judgment. My very dear friend, Ann Bellflower, lost her son uh, a few months ago. And the funeral was really going good. I liked what the pastor was saying. It was so good. And the next thing you know, he wanted to do an altar call. And he began to say, we don't understand why God took Micah. That was a lie right there. But then he said, but the Bible says it's pointed once for man to die, then the judgment. And then he prayed and asked people to accept Jesus. <laughs> I, I just don't get it. You, you, you want me to accept a God that's going to, if I don't do this, he's going to judge me and burn me in hell forever? I don't get that. Why would I marry somebody like that? But if I do, and then I mess up, he's still going to do it. So he don't love me. He just wants a slave. Right? So the Bible says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation and that he is a many-membered man. But this is the translation of it. Because God never pointed, God never pointed time for men to die again. Adam did that. Adam did that. So l listen to this. If Jesus was an earthly high priest, must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world? You know, for every person, he would just suffer over and over and over. However, now, one time, now then, in the entire completion of his messianic period, he rendered a parent and made the decision to cancel, disannul, and put away, neutralize, and bring to naught the not normal state of living as a mere human. It wasn't normal. You know, people say, well, we're just humans. This is just our natural life. No, it's a not normal life. We're still living a not normal life. It's not normal for us to be weak or sick. Lisa's at home hurting right now. They call it fibromyalgia. You know, they got a name for everything, but it's not normal. She's experiencing a not normal life. You know, people say, well, it's normal for us to get old. It's normal for us to get cancer. No, it's not. It's the not normal life. Right. I want to live the righteous life. Yeah. I want to live a life. I want to live out of my Christ life. Yeah. So the not normal state of living as a mere human by becoming the federal head victim of himself. Therefore, by reduplication of the estate of the first man, Adam, and all, the result of living with self-condemnation that produced that illegal state as an anthropos, which means Adam, living with a sense of being void of father's life, was dying off. But a decision was to be made. That's what judgment is. What proceeded was Jesus willingly became the federal head scapegoat of humanity. You know what a scapegoat was? Yes. You know, where they took all the sins of the nation and the priest pressed it on a goat, put it out in the wilderness and would not let it come back. You know what? That's what our ministry needs to be. Taking all of uh, people's self-condemnation 
everything that they think holds it back and show them that it was on Jesus. And we're not going to let that come back to you anymore. We're going to tell you, quit feeding from the dew to be tree. If you, and I say this all the time. If you're going to a church or a religion that keeps telling you that you're a sinner saved by grace and they keep you condemned all the time, run. Yes. If you had to start a home church, yes. you've got Kay Fairchild to mentor you, you've got me to mentor you, there are many, many other ministers out there that are ministering a sure word of God's grace. You don't have to feed on that dung anymore. Amen. Unless you like it. Some people do. It seems like they do because they come Sunday after Sunday to be condemned. So, he presented himself once to take within him the offense of the entire race of humankind. He, she, they that accept fully his perfect work themselves with their spirit eye wide open shall know and experience that they are the plural of Father God. It didn't say get saved, it says accept it. What does accepting mean? You, you accept the gift. You, you live out of it. And then it says, emptied of the force of missing the mark and perfect oneness with Father God as in Christ and as one corporate body. We are no longer separate anymore. Amen. No longer separate whatsoever. So the writer of the book of Hebrews was not talking about the physical death of people. He was talking about Jesus being offered then, not when people die. Jesus has been offering then. Then was the judgment. Then was the decision of the world. Then was everything that we've been told in our future. Amen. Then was a rapture. You want a rapture? Yes. It was a rapturous event. Yes. What, do you, what don't they know about raised and seated? You know, they go to, they go to this one verse in is it, uh, Ephesians where it talks about they who, uh, they who are dead in Christ. It says there will be a trump sounded and we shall rise and everybody will rise up. They think that's going to heaven. It talks about the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which will remain will be forever with the Lord. They think that's the rapture verse. That's what they think. But, but it's not. It's talking about they who await to who they are. A, tr a trumpet. An archangel is going to blow a long sounding trumpet of it is finished and they're going to explain it and then we rise up together and those who don't know who they are will rise up and we who remain in other words our bodies hasn't ceased to be able to hold us it says we will be forever not with the Lord but we will be forever with the Lord that's like a woman with child we will forever know that we are one with God why aren't you shouting <laughs> I'm going to give me a shout button <laughs> That's what preachers should do. I need a button that has massive crowds screaming and hollering across there. <laughs> but it, forever with Lord. We are with Lord, but we're going to know forever. Nothing's going to come. No weapon formed against us will prosper anymore. Amen. No false accusation that you have, you're, you have this problem or you have, you have attention to deficit syndrome or, or you have this disease. It can't come to you anymore because you know who you are That's and you right. say, not welcome here. That's right. Not welcome here. Wow. Doesn't belong to me. Wow. There is no judgment of sin and death. We must agree. There's no judgment from sin and death. How it's impossible uh, without faith in all what we're teaching Without faith to the passion of Jesus Christ, it's impossible to agree with God. You will not agree with God that you're righteous and holy today if you don't understand what Jesus did. And that is a big problem, family, because I see a lot of preachers out there preaching grace. I see a lot of really good things, but there's still a lot of proclamation. And proclamation's good. I'm thankful for the proclaimers. But until you can explain it, people aren't going to live out of it. Because they could get on Facebook, they could go to conferences, they could go and hear about the grace of God and how much God loves you and cares for you, and you're not, you're not who you think you are. But if they can't take you through the Pauline revelation and explain exactly in detail what Jesus did, you will never live out of it. I mean, that's not just me, it's the Bible. I mean, God said you can't understand these things, guys. Because your spirit hasn't been revivified and pushed forward. But you're going to need teachers after I go to the cross. You're going to need people to help you. And so I'm going to send you many comforters who will lead you and guide you into the truth of the things that I've done. And he did that with Paul. Now Paul went to the Arabian Desert. He wasn't sitting on a rock next to Jesus. He was listening to his spirit. God was speaking to him and he was writing things down. And later on, other people helped him, right? Because he was an old, old man. And what he learned was big, Donna. It wasn't something you could put in one little dinky book. He wrote several letters to the church. And so 
he explained it to him and explained it to him because if he didn't, if he didn't, if he wasn't there, do you think the people would have ever lived any different after the cross? Do you think there would have been a church? No, because the disciples didn't understand. They really didn't. Nothing in the Bible explains really what Jesus did but the epistles. The Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the disciples still were functioning from their perception a lot. So let's look, look at Matthew 10, 15. I've got a few more minutes. So what do we do? We want to experience who we are by walking in the realization. We want to realize these things are, are so. It's just like I say, Donna, I can tell you I sent you money, it's coming in the mail, but the realization doesn't take place until you open it up and you go write it. So proclam I proclaim to you that it's coming and you go home and there's nothing in the mailbox. There's nothing in the mailbox. And you call me and say, Roy, I thought you were sending me money. But, but you won't do that because you would be ashamed to do that. So people should have said, God, I thought these things were true. And God could have said, they are true, but you're looking in the wrong direction. You need to hear the voice behind you, not in front of you. Right? And you need to believe. So Donna, they're not a check coming up. So, <laughs> so here is another statement that Jesus makes that religion-minded people use against people. In Matthew 10, 15. We're going to go there and then 11, 24 and 12, 41. So Matthew 10, 15. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Right off the bat, they just confirm. Yeah, see, God did judge them. But let's, let's go on through here. Judgment is to decree or to declare or to decide, right? Okay, now go to Matthew eleven twenty four. 24. You there? 11, 24. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom, same thing as Sodom and Gomorrah, and the day of judgment than for thee. Matthew 12, 41. So who, who was Jesus talking to then about thee? It was the people that rejected him. And who was that? The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders. Verse 41 of chapter 12. 41? Uh -huh, verse 41 of chapter 12. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. What? You mean not the future generation? No, this generation. And shall condemn it because they repented, uh, because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater Jonas is here. In other words, they, they repented, but there's greater than Jonas is here. The man that Jonas pictured is here. Yes. The man that really did enter into the great fish. He's, he's here, and yet you're, re you're rejecting me. And then it says, The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Yes. I love preaching the Queen of Sheba. I love to preach when, and I've done it, when she comes to Solomon, she sees all this stuff. It's a picture of seeing what Jesus did. It's a powerful, and it says the Spirit left her. In other words, all the questioning left her. She said, man, the half had only been told me. You only told me that I was a sinner saved by grace and that he saved me, but I'm still a sinner. But now I know the truth. All my questions have been answered. But Jesus said, you admire all that in your Old Testament stories, you know, talking to them. But, but greater than him is standing here in front of you and you reject me. And I was looking at that and it was talking about people in Capernaum. It was talking about the citizens of Beth Bethsaida. These were two cities in, in uh, Palestine. Uh, for they, and there, it, it said that there was great works done in their city and yet they rejected and they blinded. So they got a greater judgment. What was their judgment? Self-condemnation. What was their judgment? They made a decision not to believe. And so they brought it on themselves. See, I do believe people need to believe it. How can they believe unless a preacher, a most holy place preacher is sent? But today we're here, we're available, but people still don't want it. I mean, look at this fellowship here. I mean, I'm fine with it. But there are people right here in Oklahoma City that, that were part of our fellowship before. and they just, They're just they sitting at home. I don't understand it. Honest to God, I don't. They chase conferences where it's fun. I mean, yeah, it's fun to go to a conference. But what about day-to-day -day living? 
What about being equipped to be a blessing yourself? Yes. Oh, I can stay home and listen to it. Well, I don't know. I guess you can and it's all right. But there's nothing like being together with the body. And there's nothing like helping the guy that's grinding it out yes. or the lady that's grinding it out. I mean, we sometimes we do need to see a few more people in the audience. Yes. Amen. I don't mean to sound like I'm whining, but I'm telling you, something is greater here today than you had 20 years ago. Amen. I'll boldly say this. I'm a greater minister of the gospel today than what you had 20 years ago. Amen. Not me, not, not my natural ability. Well, yeah, it's my natural abilities, my spirit. I'm living on the spirit. I'm learning things. You can't live on what you learned 20 years ago because it leaks. Yeah. I tell Melanie, my friend, that all the time. I'll get to talking to her and she'll say stuff that was like we learned in our previous church back on 55th and May. And I'll say, Melanie, and she said, what? I said, your brain's leaking. You know that's not true. And then she said, oh, I know, I know. I said, well, I know you know, but you're, it's leaking. <laughs> It'll always gravitate back to the old if you don't keep feeding on the truth. Yes. It's like me. I, my life is 100% better on a low-carb diet. My body is just made for that. My body stores carbs. I could eat some carbs. I'll give you an example. I've been on it for about three weeks. I feel really good. I'm beginning to trim down. Uh, I, I'm thinking better. I'm sleeping really good. I'm not tossing and turning anymore. You know, because that's an enemy to me. Well, we went to eat with Carl and Ann Friday night, and they were having a fish fry. And, and stupidly, I mean, there was nothing else to eat. I hadn't eaten all day. I had a couple of eggs early in the morning, about 7 o'clock, and I was hungry. Well, fried fish with cornmeal is one of my favorite meals. And I know I shouldn't eat french fries, but it looked good. And so I ate it. And they didn't give me very much, although Carl thinks I had plenty. The first plate was very, just little chunks of fish. So I went back and got some more fish. Well, by the time we got home and started playing cards, I felt like somebody hooked me up to a morphine pump. I got tireder and tireder and tireder. I really got scared for a moment. I thought something's wrong with me. Then I realized I had put poison in my body. And I couldn't even drive home. Donna had to drive me home. And I hit that bed and I mean, I was gone. And, but guess what happened the next day? It all came out of me with a vengeance. <laughs> but guess what? My body, my body was telling me, okay, you can stop laughing. My body was telling me, this is not good for you. Now, if I'm, now let's get back to my story because it's important. If I'm just eating carbs, and if I eat carbs all the time, and I've just been, I didn't go on that on that low carb diet. I ate it; it wouldn't bother me one bit because I'm used to it. Yes. Yeah. You get where I'm going? Yes. So people are used to the dung that Paul said I considered it all dung. People go to churches all over the world, and they feed on dung, and they feed on dung, and they're used to it, so it's not hurting them, and and they're but it is hurting them. Yeah. But they think it's not. And they're used to it. So they say, Amen. And people fight me all the time that they're sinners saved by grace. And when I say I've never done anything to separate myself from the love of God, they just look, boy, we need to get away from that guy. And the sad thing is, and Kay can tell you this, we have beloved friends out there that are telling people to stay away from us. They're literally stopping people from having us in. They hear somebody's going to have us in. And there's been a few times where they warn them. That's terrible. Yeah. That's saying, no, 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 you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not mature enough to feed on the holy place truth. You need to, here, you keep eating this. And it keeps them children. Right? And it keeps them from being who God wants them to be. So Jesus is saying the judgment was in that generation, not this generation. So, Therefore, we find that Jesus redefined, restored everything that took place with Father God, what he decreed. And he said, do not partake of the knowledge of good and evil. In dying, you shall die. We need to tell people, stop it. No, I'm not saying stop smoking. I'm not saying stop drugs. I'm saying stop condemning yourself. Because when you condemn yourself, you're saying, I've done something that keeps me from being who I am. 
No, you've done something to keep you from experiencing it. You've done something to keep you from manifesting in your life because you feel like it, could, can, it can stop you from it, but it's a lie. So stop self-condemning yourself and just feed on the truth and the truth will make you free. You don't need to go to counseling to learn how to quit eating ice cream. You need to feed on the truth. Now, if you have a good friend that you can trust, I can go to Carl and say, Carl, I've got a problem. You know, I'm feeding on the Word, but I just need you to know I have a problem with eating too much ice cream. Every day on the way home, I go by Dairy Queen and I get an ice cream cone. No, I don't. I'm just using that example. I joke at my job and I say when I don't make a sale, I console myself for the Dairy Queen. And when I do make a sale, I celebrate with the Dairy Queen. <laughs> <laughs> But I can tell Carl that. So Carl can, I said, Carl, I need your help. I need you to hold me accountable. Would you? And you would, wouldn't you? So Carl would call me every once in a while and check on me. First thing he would say, Roy, make a new route going home. You know where the Brahms are. You know where the Dairy Queens are. Don't drive down those roads anymore. No, because of that temptation is there. And then keep feeding on the truth. Why don't you eat some broccoli? <laughs> Eat some carrots. <laughs> Rod, that's good. <laughs> so the truth is, quit being your own accuser. Amen. That's what I want to say. Quit being. The accuser of the brethren is not some entity called a devil. It's religion. It's the traditions of religion. And it's you because you've got the wrong information in your brain and you keep accusing yourself. Stop it. Okay? So... We believe that we're in a critical mass in this earth today. We believe that there's a teaching coming out that's going to swallow up everything that people are spewing out of their mouths. And what they're spewing out of their mouths is what has been said for year after year after year. When I get around religious-minded people, I can, I, I can tell you what they're going to say because 10,000 people before them have said the same thing. <laughs> they're saying what they said, what they said, what they said, what they, and nobody stops and questions to see if, see if it be so. And it's not changing anybody. That man that told me that he went to that counseling with that minister, which is a good man. I know him. I know him. He's a very well-known man in Moore, Oklahoma. And he told him that he didn't say the right prayer. That's the thing that was spewed out of every minister before him in that denomination. Because they believe you had to say it just right. If you're baptized in water, you have to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And if they didn't say that, you didn't get baptized. If you don't say the sinner's prayer just right, you didn't get... They're spewing the same thing out. I expect it to come from them. Because they're in that denomination. And they're taught to say these things and it's bringing no help to anybody. Just like this man said, said it didn't help him. So once we become gripped by the truthful gospel, by walking in that realization, and we ponder on what we hear... Ponder means to meditate. When we chew the cud on what we hear, where it gets inside of it, then we're going to go forth ministering the truth to all those people who are hungry. We quit making it about us. One of the best things you can do when you're sick, when you're depressed, whatever it is, is don't make it about you. Start doing things for somebody else. Just pull yourself up and start doing something for other people. I promise you it'd make a difference. I've told, I've told my mom a long time ago, if I was to diagnose, I do do this, but I don't wait for that. But if I was diagnosed with some kind of disease, I would find places where they, where they treat people with that disease and I'd go minister to them. I'd bring cake, I'd bring cookie, I would bring, I would bring something to start blessing people and get out of my conscious awareness and get into the mind of Christ and be God to them. I watched a video on Facebook, you can see it online that I love. This little boy was walking out of his house and he... Mom had packed him lunch, and she said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to go find God. Have y'all seen that? Oh, Sandy shared it with me. I love that, Sandy. It brought tears to my eyes. It came from the shack, probably. But he, he goes looking for God, and there's a, there's a black lady sitting on a bench. Looks like she might be a street person or something. I'm not sure. And he sits down and smiles at her, and she smiles. And uh, he opens up his Twinkies. You know, he had, it says something about Twinkies. What does it say? He shared it was lunch with God. But oh, he's going to have lunch with God, but he brings Twinkie. So he sits there and he's opening it up and opening it up. And he looks at her and she smiles again. And then he, he, he thinks, so he gives her one. And she eats and he eats his and they're laughing and giggling. And then uh, he, he gives her a bottle of something to drink. She starts laughing. He's giggling and everything. Then he packs it up and he gets up to leave. And he turns around, walks over and hugs her really big. And so he goes home. And when he goes home, she says, did you find God? She said, 
He said, yes, but he's a black woman. Yeah. And then it shows the woman going and sitting down by another person that looked like maybe live on the streets. And what did she say? She said, I had, they said, why are you smiling? And she said, uh, I had lunch with God today, and he's a lot younger than I expected. Yeah. <laughs> so he, the lady asked her for the video, because she probably couldn't hear. He said, why are you smiling? And she said, because I had lunch with God today, and he was a lot littler than I thought he was. A lot younger. <laughs> a lot younger. So, yeah, it's powerful. And see, that's what we need to do. We need to go let, have, let, allow people to have lunch with God. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. If you know somebody that's hurting, pack a lunch and just say, hey, I'm coming to visit with you. And come over and pull them out a Twinkie. Get a Twinkie. Of course, it's not good for you. <laughs> but something to make them laugh. And let them have lunch with God. Because they're never, they're, they're never going to have lunch with a physical God until you do it. Because God is spirit. God chose us to show him in this earth, to be him. God didn't need to come here and just be God all by himself. He, he could be, he was. I mean, God was forever, as far as my mind can understand, spirits forever. But he wanted, he wanted his love to be experienced by people and by animals and by the creation. So go you into all the world and make disciples. That doesn't mean get them saved. It doesn't mean put them in church. I've told people, come to our fellowship. We won't put you to work. We won't ask you for your money. We won't do anything. We'll just love you. We go out to eat after church. Once a month, we buy everybody's meal. You know, so those are listening. If you live here, the last Sunday this month, we're buying everybody's meal. But please don't bring 20 children with you. <laughs> we love children, but I don't want to have that big a bill. So I like what... What Kay said on this, we must realize that fear is simply a lie baby and we will not give birth to any more lie babies. Lisa wrote me today and asked me to, for us to pray over because th that false diagnosis of fibromyalgia, she's in a lot of pain. And I wrote her back and I said, it's a lie baby and don't feed that baby anymore. And I encouraged her. I wasn't been mean to her, but we got to start thinking it's a lie baby so how do you starve to death a lie baby? You keep quit feeding it. And it will perish. It will go away. And it, the lie is that God doesn't love you. And that he could ever not love you. Remember, Ann, when we were we put a sign up in front of our fellowship and more, said God is not mad at you? And I'm sure it was a man. I, you know, forgive me if it was a woman, if you're hearing this. <laughs> Probably not. But some man put a great big cardboard sign across the street, a big box, weighted it down with rocks and everything, and it said bold letters, God is mad as hell at you. And then proceeded to list about ten different verses to confirm that God is mad at you. And that night... Huh? That God was out to get him. Yeah. That, God was, that night, a huge rainstorm come through and literally destroyed that box, and it was washed... It ended up washed over from across the street in front of our church. So the next Sunday I went there and was laying there just destroyed. <laughs> you know, God did it, I don't know. But I just, if, I would love to talk to the man. I wish I could talk to him. But prayerfully somebody's got to him. So we just, we, we just love what we're learning. I just, it's, it's just keep getting better and better. And I see by looks on your face, I can see that you have lightnings and thunderings and earthquakes. And that's what the word is supposed to do. Amen. I told somebody the other day that we're talking about the... The, uh, the what's it called? The fire, the brazen fire of labor. What is that called? Been cast into the lake of fire, lake of fire. And there was a discussion on Facebook, and I explained to him what it was. And I wrote on that we should run to the fire, run to the light, run to the beheadings. And this one guy, I think he's from Africa, he just didn't understand. And he said, I don't know about you, but he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm never going to run to the fire. You know, because he just believes it's hell, yeah. and but it's I'm running to the fire. The, the word of the word fire, God said, it's not my word of fire, they're not my messengers, flames of fire. And in the Old Testament, I mean, the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, brimstone is sulfur, then the root word is godliness, and the root word is God, it's theos, and uh, uh, travellum and birth with a with without mixture with with brimstone, with fire and brimstone. And that's the word of God yes. with revelation. Amen. Mm -hmm. So we thank God that he's burning everything away that is not us. Doesn't belong to him. He, he, we're, we're, he doesn't have to come as a thief in the night because we're opening our doors and our windows to him. 
and he's come to remove everything that's not his. When a thief comes to your home, he takes stuff that's not his, right? Yeah. So we, we don't want him to have to come in the night. You know, we don't want him to have to sneak in. We just want to open our eyes, open our ears, our sense realm, and say, Father, come in and remove everything that's hindering us. And we speak that over you. I speak that over Lisa. I speak that over anybody else that's sick in body, that the very life of God inside of them is going to remove anything that's not his. Yes. You know, uh, belief systems sometimes allow things. When doctors diagnose things over you, sometimes they're not true. I mean, they're not true, but sometimes literally they're not true. People have been diagnosed with diseases and died, and they did an autopsy, and they didn't have it. People have been diagnosed with cancer, I don't know how many times, and taken chemo and died, and they found out they never had the cancer. But as a man believeth in his realization, in his conscious awareness, it becomes their realization. There are people today that you can walk up and say, "What's wrong with you? What do you mean? You look kind of clammy. You know, you don't. You look like you don't feel good." And they're doing just fine. Next thing you know, they're sick. See, the imagination Image. is powerful, and whatever you receive into your imagination will become a a dragon. What'd you say? Manifestation. Manifestation. But it will become a great dragon that gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, there are people that hear the flu's coming and they don't get around with anybody that has the flu and they get the flu. Yeah. You know? So I choose to believe the good report of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So Father, we again, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, your comforting teacher in us and all the teachers that we have, Father. And Father, we just love you so much we we know your love i'm so thankful today father that this movie has come out yes the shack yes. i've known it needed to be out for a long time yes. people are seeing it that never read the book father and i i'm seeing so many reports how people are sitting and weeping and crying yes. through the entire movie father it's pricking their very soul and they're seeing your love father and i pray over that 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 the mouths of the naysayers will be shut I pray that people that their pastor tell them not to go, that they wake up and realize yeah. that that's, that pastor doesn't know what they're talking about. Yeah. And Father, we thank you that your love, if the church won't do it, Father, the people out of the church are going to do it. And they're going to bring forth the truth. And we thank you that it's coming to us in a great way. I thank you for our family. I thank you in our Tree of Life Fellowship. And I thank you for the fact that we know that you are our health and that we're living out of that, Father. We give you the glory for that. We bless those that are all people, but we're thankful for those who are watching by way of the internet. And we thank you, Father, that they be, are being encouraged and strengthened, and we give you the glory for that. And if you would, family, I would ask that you would share this. More people need to see this. You have a world that I can't touch. So if you share it on yours, you can't imagine how it can just spread and spread and spread, spread because people need to hear what we're teaching and what Kay's teaching. And we thank you for doing that. God bless you. Thank you. Now let's go eat some ice cream. <laughs> <laughs>